Hello, my name is Jez Miaktis from the Swiss Institute of Allergy and Asthma Research. It's a great pleasure to talk in this meeting. I would like to start with this slide. This is all about uh, what the healthcare people uh, did for us and uh, what the vaccine developers, what the drug developers did for us. And I would like to thank them uh, for their immense work to fight with the pandemic. I will talk about epithelial barrier hypothesis. For this, we have to first know uh, what allergic diseases are. And uh, there is a type two response very common in allergic diseases. And uh, this type two response is characterized with uh, peripheral and tissue eosinophilia, epithelial barrier defect, goblet cell hyperplasia, excess and bad quality mucus production, mucociliary dysfunction, and remodeling. To better understand allergic diseases, we have to understand first the origins of type two response, which is about expulsion of parasites and parasite larva. We go uh, now 30, uh, to 1930s, uh, 90 years back, uh, to Zurich University Parasitology Department and uh, discuss uh, Loeffler's pneumonia as described by William Loeffler in 1932. We, we follow the numbers here together. Infective eggs of Ascaris schistosoma or hookworms are swallowed. Afterwards, eggs reach the small intestine and hatch. The larva go out of the eggs, and uh, then uh, the larva are at the size of 0.5 to 1 millimeter. They migrate to liver and then to lungs. And eosinophilic pneumonia takes place, which is called Loeffler's pneumonia. There is cough, and uh, every single larva are exposed from the lungs at that time. And the larva is 0.5 to 1 millimeter size, but the adult ascaris is 10 to 15 centimeters. So uh, the larvae should be thrown away from the lungs and they should be ingested again. And uh, they should find a space in the gastrointestinal tract to grow uh, bigger and at the size of 10 to 15 centimeters. Because if the larva grow big uh, and, and become adults inside the lung, then something like that will happen. And it is a killing situation because I uh, think that there is uh, 50 adult ascaris in the respiratory tract of a child. So this is a very successful uh, expulsion response and every single larva are exposed and uh, there is no problem at all uh, other than with uh, cramps, abdominal cramps and anemia. So this is a, a very important mechanism why we have a type two response in humans. So here is another important part of type two response. This is a uh, sarcoptes scabi and uh, it's the agent of scabies and it's uh, making a skin inflammation and again, and eosinophilic inflammation in the skin. And there, a type two response is developing against the sarcop that it doesn't go to deeper tissues. It stays in skin and it's also expulsed from the skin with uh, each scratch and eosinophilic inflammation. To better understand the epithelial barrier, we have to look at this slide. This was uh, made by Mikhail Zoika and published in uh, 2012. And this is showing the tight junctions of sinus mucosa. And they are so tight that even water cannot pass through. And epithelial barrier uh, damaging substances have introduced our life very significantly after 1960s, uh, like an avalanche. Here you can see an avalanche uh, which happened in Davos in 2019, uh, the day before the World Economic Forum. And you can see that this avalanche is coming down and it will, it's getting bigger and bigger. And our problem nowadays. Uh, for uh, allergic diseases, autoimmune diseases, and certain neuropsychiatric diseases is like that. Their prevalence was uh, very, very little, actually less than 1% allergic diseases in 1960s, which increased to more than 20% now all around the world. So the avalanche is big and many factors are playing a role in the development of these allergic diseases. The avalanche comes and then uh, turns the car, uh, which makes the video upside down. So that's a, a very important and very significant video that explains us uh, this figure. Here we have uh, many agents that came to our lives after 1960s. Here we can count them. Laundry and dishwasher detergents, household cleaners, toothpaste, surfactants, nanoparticles, diesel exhaust, ozone, enzymes and emulsifiers in processed food, particulate matter, gluten sensitivity, microplastic, they, some of them were existing uh, with very low levels. And uh, we have here allergens, bacteria, cigarette smoke, fungi, and mites 
uh, that are damaging the barrier, but uh, the input of uh, the uh, substances that in were introduced to our lives after modernization, urbanization, and industrialization is huge. The epithelial cells are not making a strong barrier anymore, and uh, the microbiome uh, and goes uh, deeper, and there is a leaky barrier concept developing in this talk that you will uh, understand. This is some of the data from detergent exposure, and here, one to 50,000 times diluted detergents were used, and uh, normally a, a dishwasher or a, a laundry has a, a rinse factor or dilution factor of one to 2,500. This is a huge dilution, one to 50,000, and we can see that uh, there is a very significant effect of detergent compared to no exposure in a healthy uh, bronchial mucosa, asthmatic bronchial mucosal epithelial cells, and COPD bronchial mucosal epithelial cells. Mostly the same genes are uh, regulated, but there are some also uh, disease-related uh, differences. The summary of this finding is that uh, there is lipid metabolism, oxidative stress, and cell survival are upregulated with one to 50,000 uh, dilution of detergents. And cell adhesion, extracellular matrix organization, and wound healing are downregulated. The interpretation of this data is there is a chronic wound that tries to survive the cells. And this is happening in our uh, bronchial mucosa, in our sinus no uh, and nasal mucosa. And this is a very uh, serious case, actually. And what happened after 2000 is that we had also uh, exposure to dishwasher detergents. Dishwasher devices it, were introduced to our lives uh, in the homes after 1980s, but they were very commonly used after 2000s. And there's professional dishwashers that are being used in your universities, in the restaurants. And we have food emulsifiers uh, that are known for uh, many years, but they uh, are started to be used more and more after 1960s. Microplastic, uh, it's uh, said to be as a uh, problem of the ocean for the whales, but uh, we can easily say that it's the problem of all humanity because we have a huge microplastic exposure in inner cities and nanoparticles are all, uh, all the stains and um, really uh, made uh, materials, and uh, we are also exposed to nanoparticles a lot. Food emulsifiers is a huge problem for food allergy and uh, use of esophagitis and colitis, uh, as we can see from many uh, publications. And here is a list of uh, European uh, legislation uh, and allowed uh, emulsifiers. We can see here E432, E433. These are polysorbates, twin 20. And twin 80, these are uh, the twins that we are using in our experiments. You can, you, if you have touched a twin, you can uh, see how soapy it is and how uh, detergent it is. And these are uh, emulsifiers. And to understand what an emulsifier is, you have to, uh, for example, make apple juice or tomato juice at home. And if you wait for one hour, the water part separates from the solid part. This is very normal, very healthy. But if you add uh, very little, uh, for uh, for example, 10 gram uh, of polysorbate to uh, 10 liters of water, then you can see that uh, this polysorbate uh, increases the surface tension and holds the water on the uh, apple uh, pieces and uh, structures uh, and the solid part of the apple or so, so, uh, solid part of the tomato. And then it does make a, a water la layer. That's an important thing to know because these polysorbates are now very commonly used in ice creams in uh, bread, in pastry. So we are uh, being uh, continuously exposed uh, to these polysorbates uh, in pizza sauce, for example, in our daily lives. And mi micro and nanoplastic uh, were introduced to us as a big problem of the Pacific Ocean, but uh, it's not uh, true. Uh, we are being exposed to a million uh, tons uh, per year. Uh, it is like a mountain size, uh, the every year uh, produced uh, plastic, and uh, they are, uh, the degraded to microplastic, nanoplastic, angstrom size uh, plastic. And they, these, are, uh, these particles are ingested by cells. They are immune modulatory, epithelial barrier opening, and also binding to cer certain receptors. And this is also another huge problem. So we understood in our research, which is around uh, 60 publications related to epithelial cells, and uh, that epithelial barrier is defective in asthma chronic rhinosinusitis, otopic dermatitis, and colitis. And we did these experiments by using biopsies from bronchi, sinus, esophagus, intestine, skin, and by making air liquid interface cultures, 
And currently we are making also uh, tissue organoids uh, that like airway organoids, sinus organoids, skin organoids, and three-dimensional artificial skins uh, to understand uh, the role of environmental factors. So if we uh, summarize here uh, the functions of epithelial barrier, we can talk about closed epithelial barrier, which is a, a normal case, and uh, the barrier that is protective against environment and microbiome and avoid loss of tissue fluids. But if the barrier opens, it's also sometimes useful if there's too much inflammation in the subepithelial area, cells, cytokines, and small molecules are draining to the lumen, but at the same time, allergens, pollutants, toxins are accessible to deeper tissues. So we understood with our research that both type one and type two response opens epithelial barrier. We can see in this uh, video very clearly uh, a video uh, done by uh, Martin Marziniak, a just PhD student uh, many years ago, and but very demonstrative. Uh, still here are epithelial cells and the uh, sides of epithelial cells that are touching to each other. And here are the tight junction molecules and tight junction molecules are should be a single uh, line here. Uh, they are not touching to each other uh, because uh, there is a distance between epithelial cells and the barrier is leaky, the barrier doesn't make. And this distance is in the range of 45 micrometers, four to five micrometers. So uh, this is another uh, study by Terifumi Kubo who looked at healthy and asthmatic uh, barrier and uh, found out that the CPG organoids are uh, treating this uh, damaged barrier. And here is healthy uh, barrier with claudin-4 and ZO1 staining. And this is asthmatic barrier. And you can see how defective the barrier of an asthmatic child is and, or, or an asthmatic patient is. You can see that uh, the barrier molecules are not nicely stained. And there is distribution of the barrier molecules in the cytoplasm. And it doesn't make strong borders. And there's also uh, just a double epithelial barrier borders that you can see in some parts of this. And here is a study by Mikhail Zoika, which was published in 2012 to better understand uh, sin sinusitis, chronic sinusitis pathogenesis. Uh, you should understand uh, several things. One of them is epithelial barrier defect. The second one is uh, nasal polyp pathology. And here we can see a healthy uh, sinus tissue. Occludin and ZO1 are barrier molecules, and they, they are uh, nicely uh, covering the surface of the sinus barrier. This is chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps. And there you can see that there is a big distance between the barrier molecules and uh, it's uh, impossible to cover. And think that here is stuff aerosol sitting and all of its enzymes and toxins are going into deeper tissues. And this is uh, Sudwan uh, did this studies uh, on atopic dermatitis and John Altenberg who did this uh, in the lab. And here is a normal uh, skin. Some of the uh, barrier molecules like occludin uh, is not uh, sealing the surface of the skin, but claudin uh, one, four, seven, and eight are important. And this is claudin seven staining in normal uh, skin. And this is atopic dermatitis skin, which shows a very weak staining. And there's loss of many barrier molecules as we have reported say, several times. So from this, we developed the epithelial barrier hypothesis. Epithelial barrier hypothesis explains why uh, the diseases uh, of uh, allergy, asthma, and also autoimmune diseases increased uh, during the last decades very significantly and what uh, happened after 1960s mainly. It uh, has uh, three groups of diseases. The first group is epithelial barrier defect and microbial dysbiosis is taking place in direct affected tissues. We see here atopic dermatitis, asthma, chronic rhinosinusitis, allergic rhinitis, eosinophilic esophagitis, inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease. And in the original uh, table, there's also references you can follow. There's a lot of references in this area. And the uh, main thing is the, to see that there is a barrier damage and at the same time, uh, uh, defect uh, on a microbiome and microbial dysbiosis is taking place. The second group of diseases are autoimmune and metabolic diseases that are linked to gut barrier defect and sometimes also lung barrier defect and microbial dysbiosis. We have here diabetes, obesity, fatty liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, systemic lupus, and unclosing spondylitis. And uh, all of these diseases show epithelial barrier defect in the gut and also uh, a bacterial dysbiosis and microbial dysbiosis at the same time. And uh, some of these diseases are significantly increasing during the uh, last decades, uh, which uh, is a really very uh, indicative 
of something uh, has happened to humans uh, because these diseases are also increasing. Uh, the third group of diseases are chronic neuropsychiatric conditions that are linked to gut barrier defect and microbial dysbiosis. The level of evidence in these diseases is a little bit less, but uh, it's very uh, significantly important uh, to follow these diseases. And uh, their uh, prevalence is also increasing during the uh, last decades. And they all show uh, barrier defects and also uh, certain barrier related biomarker proteins and at the same time microbial dysbiosis in the gut. We have here autism spectrum disorders, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, stress related psychiatric disorders, and chronic depression. So remember the expulsion response. We have, to, we have a very strong system to expel parasite larva, uh, but uh, what is now happening is something different. Uh, this is uh, epithelial cells. Normally they have to uh, contact to each other and the distance between epithelial cells should be uh, almost zero. Now we have a big distance in these epithelial cells and microbiome, which should normally float about the epithelial cells, now uh, migrates deeper inside the epithelium and gets in contact with basal epithelial cells and stimulates the immune system. So then uh, the microbiome also goes one step deeper and translocates to below the epithelium. And this translocated microbiome and microbial dysbiosis is very characteristic in the diseases, which I have shown you in three different tables. Immune system gets activated, dendritic cells, macrophages, uh, mast cells, T cells, B cells, innate lymphoid cells, and a type two expulsion response starts to develop against the microbiome that tries to go deeper, that tries to invade the epithelium. So the epithelium has a chronic inflammation. It starts to make uh, the cytokines, epithelial uh, cytokines like IL-25, IL-33, and TSLT, and at the same time tries to expulse the microbes that are trying to uh, go deeper in the epithelium. Another important factor is that uh, there's a type two response uh, which has Ig, Th2 cells, eosinophilia, ILC2, IL4, IL5, IL13 as the main factors. And uh, it is almost the same in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, in atopic dermatitis, uh, normally allergic atopic dermatitis, and also allergic asthma or uh, uh, non allergic asthma with uh, type 2 characteristics. And the most important thing here is that there is colonized opportunistic pathogens. In the skin of atopic dermatitis patients, more than 90%. In the sinus of chronic sinusitis patients, again, more than 90%. And also in the lung, severe asthma, more than 70%. So staph aureus is there, Morexella, hemophilus, pneumococcus are all colonizing uh, the uh, deeper tissues uh, and uh, going into uh, translocated microbiome. And translocated microbiome is very characteristic in the gut. You can easily see it. Also in the sinus mucosa, you can easily see it. And in the lung, uh, there is less bacteria uh, below the, uh, the carinea of uh, trachea, but uh, you can also see that uh, with the RNA uh, sequencing, with uh, DNA sequencing, uh, you can see that there's uh, bacteria that have passed to, uh, below the uh, epithelial barrier. The other important func uh, function of uh, this epithelial barrier hypothesis is that there is circulating microinflammatory cells they migrate into, uh, into uh, uh, different organs, distant organs, and they make the inflammation there. Here we have a section of the lung or a section of the gut. We have leaky epithelial barrier. The microbes are between the epithelium and they translocate deeper and they activate the immune system cells. And the immune system cells that are activated, they migrate to the uh, brain uh, for, uh, to cause mal uh, multiple sclerosis and they migrate to the joint to cause rheumatoid arthritis. There's an interesting uh, report of last year that in Stockholm, uh, when particulate matter, air pollution is very high, then multiple sclerosis attacks start. So the number of patients increase significantly in the inner city. That's uh, linked to somehow uh, particulate matter and air pollution. And it was shown that when there's a lot of particulate matter, uh, the dendritic cells and T cells in the lungs start to express a brain homing ligand and then they increase uh, more in the brain and exacerbate the tissues. And uh, this is uh, uh, true for humans and also uh, some models have shown this. What happens in the joints is that 
the uh, cells that are activated in the leaky barrier uh, join the capacity to go to the uh, uh, develop a capacity to go to joints and then uh, there they make uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, very significantly and uh, there, this is also proven by, by Mario Zais and colleagues uh, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, mouse models. So if we summarize epithelial barrier hypothesis, we have a vicious circle. There's exposure to barrier damaging agents. You have seen in one of the previous slides that there's around 20 different barrier damaging agents. Inflammation in the epithelium is taking place. Colonizing of opportunistic pathogens. I have discussed with you the role of Staphylococcus aureus in uh, apathetic dermatitis, bronchial sinusitis, and asthma. Microbial dysbiosis is taking place. So this epithelial barrier hypothesis fully involves uh, the uh, microbiota uh, hypothesis and uh, also microbial diversity, bi biodiversity hypothesis. And uh, there's because microbial dysbiosis is taking place uh, uh, and there's translocation of microbiota to sub epithelial areas. And the reason for this is that there is an immune response to commensals and opportunistic pathogens uh, in all epithelial barrier uh, leaky tissues. And then a defective barrier healing capacity takes place. So the epithelium does not close and toxins and uh, pollutants go deeper in the tissues and a chronic uh, facet inflammation takes place. And this is currently affecting 2 billion patients. It's a huge number of patients. So we were uh, lucky to work in the area of skin barrier in the beginning, starting from the 2000s. And uh, we are now uh, having a device to detect a uh, skin barrier, uh, which is a very robust device that uh, detects uh, skin barrier in eight seconds um, by uh, electric impedance meter. And here it's a diagnostic uh, method for uh, various skin diseases like atopic dermatitis and melanoma. It's possible for treatment follow-up. It's possible for clinical trial monitoring and early prediction of treatment response and early prediction of atopic development. This part is very close to my heart. Uh, the aim here is uh, to check uh, the uh, babies at the age of uh, one month and four months and to say that these babies may develop uh, eczema, infantile eczema, and it's good to put them in a protection program. The other uh, slide also is showing here is the pinpoint of this uh, device that we had uh, developed in 2013. Now we have a very modern device together with the Sybase company, and uh, these are the, these devices. And we have made the first paper with Arturo Rinaldi, looked at uh, the epithelial barrier damage uh, with papain, trypsin, cholerotoxin, tape stripping, and showed a very distinct uh, uh, diagnosis of these barrier defect. We have done a study with uh, detergents, and this is a clinical study uh, with uh, humans, and here is healthy human skin, which shows the electric impedance score is very uh, low, and this is non-lesional skin of atopic dermatitis, and this is lesional skin of atopic dermatitis, and uh, you can see that there is a big difference uh, and uh, also a very uh, robust uh, understanding of uh, the barrier damage, which is detected within eight seconds. So what, is, what are the future prospects of epithelial barrier hypothesis? We have here some points that we have to think all together and develop uh, the uh, state of the world and improve the state of the world uh, by thinking very carefully on the barrier hypothesis. There, uh, we have prevention, early intervention, and treatment possibilities. We need avoidance and dose control of all of the above mentioned products, detergents, household cleaners, ozone, microplastic, nanoplastic, uh, mites at home, and there's a development of safer and less toxic products which are aimed by detergent companies. They are developing these safe products continuously. Discovery of biomarkers for the identification of barrier leaky subjects. The work is going on uh, very efficiently. Development of novel therapeutic approaches for tightening the tissue specific barrier molecules. So if you give, for example, dupilima for asthma, you suppress the inflammation. Now it's time to strengthen the barrier so that there is no, not any more inflammation. And strengthening other components of the mucosal barrier, uh, blocking uh, bacterial translocation is very important. Avoiding colonization of opportunistic pathogens because staph aureus is always problematic if it is in the skin and it uh, also prevents the healing of the skin and also causes relapses and exacerbations. Interventions through diet, microbiome, uh, these are being discussed, you know, induction of immune tolerance, 
Also, the effect of short chain fatty acids are very important, and vitamin D and retinoic acids are very important, and there's many more uh, novel approaches. So, I stop here by thanking our co workers, Paulina, Ming, Mikhail, Kazu, Teru, Hide, uh, John, and collaborators, Roger Launer, Peter Schmidt, Grandenmeyer, Claudia Trail Hoffman, Johan Nagache, Liam Mahoney, and Lachin, Zeynep, Ismail, Yoz. And uh, uh, Karina Dao, Milana Sokolowska, Arturo Rinaldi, and Mubeche Rakis. I uh, thank you for your attention. I uh, invite you to our VIRM, uh, which is taking place uh, next week. And this is our new institute. You are all invited to come and join. Uh, this is a very compact institute with all the required uh, instruments. And uh, I look forward to working with you in collaboration here also. I wish you a successful Congress and uh, thank you for your attention. I'm now ready for your questions.